All right, let's get started here. All right, so we talked about naming aldehydes and ketones and sort of what made them different than other carbonyl compounds on Thursday. Um, and the, the key aspect of the of the carbon of the aldehydes and ketones is that because they don't have a good leaving group attached to them, they're more likely to go through um, through nucleophilic addition than substitution. When we get to talking about the acid derivatives, we're going to see that they they're all fairly likely to go through nucleophilic substitution and reform a carbonyl compound at the end. The aldehydes and ketones don't do that. All right, so let's go ahead and review where we were, where we ended the other day. Um, so we, we ended with this mechanism that was nucleophilic addition under basic conditions. Um, and the, the general idea is it's similar to, to electrophilic addition that we saw back when we talked about alkenes and alkynes. Um, you have a nucleophile that's, a, except in this case, it's a nucleophile that's attracted instead of an electrophile. So your nucleophile is attracted to the partial positive on the, um, on the carbonyl carbon. And that partial positive in order to, to accommodate the nucleophile coming in with extra electrons, we have to break the pi bond um, between the carbon and the oxygen and turn it into a sp3 carbon. All right, we're going here. So our, our positive charge, just a reminder, our positive charge was, is where the, carbonyl carbon is, so that's that red section. You'll notice that the, the hydrogens on the beta carbons, um, or sorry, on the alpha carbons next to the carbonyl are also a fairly strong partial positive. And that's actually the other aspect of um, carbonyl reactions is that those alpha carbons, uh, meaning these carbons or these hydrogens attached to the alpha carbons, those actually wind up being fairly acidic relative to regular alkanes because they're um, conjugated with a carbonyl group. So conjugation and resonance is still gonna wind up playing a big role in, this, in these chapters. All right, and so then the, the second step of this, once we make that tetrahedral intermediate, that sp3 carbon, we just have an oxygen that needs to be protonated. So a, a simple enough mechanisms, very simple or similar to the um, electrophilic addition of alkenes, except that those started with a proton transfer. H plus ions are, are electrophilic, right? They're attracted to negative charges. So you did the proton transfer first, and then the nucleophile came in and attacked the carbocation that resulted. Here, we just have the two steps flipped. The nucleophilic step happens first, and then the electrophilic step. Right, and recap as well, the, in general, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones because the partial positive on the carbonyl carbon is stronger. So remember alkyl groups, carbon sp3 carbons, uh, are electron donating groups, just like we talked about with the aromatic um, substitution. And so if you have two electron donating groups on a ketone, there's less partial positive for that, or that nucleophile, excuse me, to come in and attach. And so if we had to choose only one of two possible carbonyls, it's going, we're going to see the aldehyde reacting first. Uh, and the list of possible nucleophiles is pretty large. We're going we're gonna to spend some time talking specifically about oxygen nucleophiles and nitrogen nucleophiles. 
but anything that's going to that either has a negative charge or that it's going to be attracted to a partial positive um, could be a nucleophile in this case. So water, alcohols, diols, um, sulf sulfur groups, nitrogens, hydride sources, Grignard reagents, those are all possible nucleophiles that we could see for these reactions. But none of them are really going to change what the reaction is. Your nucleophile is attached, attaches to the carbonyl carbon and breaks the carbon oxygen pi bond. And then you protonate the resulting um, oxygen anion. So this reaction will also happen under acidic conditions. So if you if it was under acidic conditions, what would the mechanism look like? And I'll, I'm going to give you guys a few moments to try and write out a mechanism. All right, so first things first, and I'll go through this and we'll and draw the um the steps for you in a second. We have acidic conditions. The first thing that we should be thinking about is well, acidic conditions means we're, we have something that's going to give away a proton, right? An H plus. So that can the likely place for that to happen is on the partial negative of the carbonyl. So your first step look like this. If you have a hydro, a proton source, whatever that is, it's just hydronium as a um, standard stand-in for for any base. Um, you're going to protonate the carbonyl oxygen. You're not going to break any bonds though, because bringing in an H plus and attaching it to the oxygen didn't bring any extra electrons, right? So we still can have everything with a full valence at this point. So what that effectively does is we wind up making um, a weakened carbonyl bond. We wind up with an oxygen with a positive charge as our carbonyl, and that makes it easier for a, a weaker nucleophile. So even something that normally we wouldn't think of it as being a, a strong enough nucleophile to really attack. Um, that uh, carbonyl carbon, something like water, for instance, all of a sudden becomes a strong enough nucleophile that it can come in here and attach. And so we can still wind up with um, the similar net reaction. We just, again, we just switched the two steps. We protonated the oxygen first, and then we had our nucleophile attack. And then so that would give us a a second intermediate that would look like it would look like this 
where whatever our weaker nucleophile is, it's now covalently attached to the carbonyl carbon or what was the carbonyl carbon. Um, and then we have one more proton transfer. So just like with a lot of, of our reactions, when we do the reaction under acidic conditions, we wind up with extra proton transfer steps, because, but we wind up with the reaction being able to happen with weaker nucleophiles because we don't have, um, we don't need something strong enough to break that carbon oxygen pi bond on its own. It's, it's, it's similar in um, SN1 and SN2 reactions to making uh, a better leaving group. We made something that was easier to break the carbon oxygen pi bond by protonating the, the carbonyl oxygen. So then our last step here would just, would be if we had, Another water molecule around, you can wind up with that water molecule grabbing the extra, one of the extra hydrogens, and we wind up turning that into a diol. <coughs> All right, so. The steps in this case you go proton transfer and you protonate the carbonyl oxygen, nucleophilic attack that breaks the carbon oxygen pi bond, and then another proton transfer if you need to to get to your final uh, neutral product. Questions on that mechanism, on either of the two mechanisms? Can you just um, could you just briefly say again? So the major differences between acidic and basic conditions. So um, acidic acidic conditions in general mean you have extra protons around, right? So okay. you're going to see more proton transfer steps usually, and it's usually going to start with a proton transfer step. The rest of this mechanism was the same. Right. Okay. Um, we just started with the proton transfer step, and that's what allowed us to use a weaker nucleophile like water. Normally, water is not strong enough of a nucleophile to come in and break that carbon-oxygen pi bond. Mm -hmm. But because we have acidic conditions and we can protonate that carbon or the um, carbonyl oxygen, which I'm trying to clean up the notations there. Um, we can we can wind up with those weaker nucleophiles actually having this reaction happen. So nucleophilic addition reactions. There's basic conditions, which is um, oh Just this is acidic, this is acidic conditions. Oh uh, okay great. So it's so under acidic conditions, you have the proton transfer first, and then the nucleophilic attack. And then if your nucleophile has a charge after it's attached, like the ox like the water did. Mm -hmm. then you do one extra proton transfer to, to get it back to being neutral. Um, us basic conditions, these were just flipped. OK, it's OK. So basic conditions look like. Nucleophilic attack and then proton yeah. transfer. Yeah. OK. I'm trying to find where that one actually is. It must be back further than I thought. Um, or it's not explicitly written out in here, apparently. Uh, there's base catalyzed hydration, um, nucleophilic attack first, and then the proton transfer. OK, awesome. <clears throat> yeah. No problem. And I already had it pulled up. Look at that. All right, so let's practice, draw the mechanism for each of these and decide whether it should be under acidic conditions or basic conditions. So get, try and get the order right on these based on what the reagents are. Right, again, I'll give you a couple minutes and we'll go through these. <clears throat> 
All right, so for this first one, um, we have a Grignard reagent being added, and then we're adding water. So the order of these steps, the fact that it's a Grignard reagent, if it's a Grignard reagent, a Grignard reagent will react very quickly with any acid around to not make the product that you want. It'll just wind up protonating the Grignard reagent and you're gonna wind up making ethane in this case. So if you, Grignard reagents are strong bases, which means we sh, um, we're we doing this reaction under basic conditions. So we with the, go with the nucleophile attacks first, and then we follow it up with the proton transfer. So we'd wind up with a intermediate that looks like that except neater, hopefully, on your own notes. And then from there, once you have water around, we do the proton transfer. All right, so just recognizing one, the order of the steps, and two, which of the which of the reagents are acids versus bases is going to allow you to pick between these two mechanisms. Um, and in general, nucleophiles are also bases. So if your first step starts with the strong nucleophile, it's going to be base catalyzed. Is if your first step, if it's not clear what your first step is, or if you have something that you can clearly recognize as being an acid, then you're going to go with the proton transfer step first. So for B would be a case of acid transfer. We have hydrochloric acid there, right? So our first step is going to be the one of the lone pairs from the oxygen grabs that proton and you wind up making chloride. So then our, our intermediate winds up looking like this, and then we have chloride still floating around. So in this case, you're told what the final product was, but even if you weren't told what the final product was, the fact that we've got something with a negative charge floating around tells us that can be a nucleophile. We know from experience that the halogens are good leaving groups, which means they're not very good nucleophiles, but the fact we're doing this under acidic conditions means we can still have it come in and attach to that carbonyl oxygen and break the pi bond. So we get the product they give us. But whatever that acid is can be the nucleophile. If we did this with acetic acid instead of with um, hydrochloric acid, we would just wind up with acetate acting as a nucleophile. And we wind up making an ester in that case. Um, if we do this with, um, heck, you do this with phenol. Phenol is maybe even a strong enough acid um, to act to catalyze this reaction. And then you would wind up attaching um, a phenol group, a benzene ring um, attached via an ether, right? So whatever you have that can donate a proton can be a nucleophile once it's donated that proton. Right. Hopefully at this point in, in this series, um, all of these chapters are starting to get a little repetitive because all we do is we add a new functional group and then we add a couple mechanisms that look a lot like the older mechanisms, right? Um, and it's basically just building up vocabulary and building up, building up your, your toolbox of what reactions you have. Um, but the individual mechanisms really are not all that different. So we're going to add we're going to add a couple new they're technically new mechanisms but 
really not because they're basically just going to be um, ways we can make diols and what are and called uh, hemiacetals and acetals, which are um, ethers that are the result of making of hydrating these carbonyl groups. Um, so if we if we have water, we already did this as an example. If water is the nucleophile, the result is a hydration reaction where you added where you wind up turning the carbonyl oxygen into an alcohol, and then we added another alcohol on there. So if we had acetone, which is our simplest ketone, so there's acetone. If we have acetone reacting with water, we're just gonna hydrate that bond meaning we're gonna add an OH to one side of the bond and a hydrogen to the other side of the bond. To make the diol. And if we did this in, in an acidic environment, we'd wind up protonating first and then having the water attack just like we practiced drawing earlier. So the mechanism would look something like Our first step would look something like this. We'd wind up with protonated acetone. Then we have the water come in as the nucleophile. And then we wind up needing to do one last proton transfer step at the end we'd wind up making another intermediate that would look like this. And then we would just need to have something else, probably just another water molecule around to act as a base. To give us our final product. Basic conditions will still give you the same reaction. It just happens in a different order. All right, if we do this, with an alcohol as the nucleophile instead of water, instead of making a diol, we make what's called a hemiacetal or an acetal. Um, and these terms are not strictly speaking different functional groups. A hemiacetal just has an alcohol and an ether attached to the same carbon. And an acetal has two ethers attached to the same carbon. Um, these terms, hemiacetal and acetal, are really a holdover from when they first started studying biochemistry and they noticed that carbohydrates formed these linked polymers. Um, and these linked polymers, if the end the, the ring structure of the carbohydrates, tended to either be hemiacetals or acetals, depending on the conditions. Um, so, but the, the basic process is identical to what we just did, right? Except that we have alcohol instead of water as our nucleophile. It's under basic conditions that the, the alcohol would attach here, make room, and then you would have to protonate that oxygen. You could do that again 
if you if you were under the right conditions, you could actually have your alcohol act as a nucleophile again and have water act as a leaving group. So going to the hemiacetal is the same mechanism we've been talking about. Going, if we go to the acetal, where you have two ethers attached, that's actually more like a nucleophilic substitution where you've got OH as your leaving group and you have alcohol as your nucleophile coming in to replace it. So basically we're, we're coupling two different mechanisms, nucleophilic addition followed by nucleophilic substitution. But the, so the result is technically a different mechanism, but it's really just two mechanisms we've already done, just put together. Um, and in general, the most stable state for these is going to be the carbonyl. Usually, the reaction is going to, the equilibrium is going to favor keeping the carbonyl formed. Uh, however, if you have really small molecules, if your carbonyl is really, really small, you um, like formaldehyde, formaldehyde doesn't actually exist as formaldehyde. Formaldehyde would look like, um, would be one carbon. So it's actually, would just look like, that. So it's methanaldehyde would be the, the technical name. Um, it's actually pretty unstable like this. It doesn't have any electron donating groups around it, right? So it's even, it's twice as reactive as an aldehyde compared to a ketone. And we already said aldehydes are more reactive because they don't have more methyl groups around, more alkyl groups around. So formaldehyde is so reactive that it actually, if you put it in water, doesn't exist as formaldehyde. Or if you put it in ethanol, it doesn't exist as formaldehyde. It will actually react with the ethanol to make either the hemiacetal or the acetal. Um, so what would that look like if we had formaldehyde? Usually formaldehyde in biolabs is actually stored as formalin, which is formaldehyde in an ethanol solution. So what would that molecule look like? What would the product look like of formaldehyde reacting with ethanol to make a hemiacetal? I'll give you guys a second to think about that one. So the reaction would be formaldehyde plus ethanol. It was going to make the first step here would be to have the alcohol act as the nucleophile and then protonate the carbonyl. So the hemiacetal would actually look like we have a carbon here, turn that carbonyl oxygen into an OH, turn the ethanol into an ether. So I'm drawing out the carbon that was the carbonyl carbon just for the, because otherwise it's going to look like a very odd molecule. something like that. So this is actually the form that you're more likely to find formaldehyde in when you have a formalin solution, because that, that formaldehyde is so reactive. If you put it around ethanol, you wind up with this as your product. And if it reacted again, to now go through a nucleophilic substitution to make the acetal, we'd wind up with the oxygen, the alcohol leaving, and being replaced with another ether. So we would actually wind up with this molecule, which drawn properly in skeletal structure would look like that. 
Um, and considering we, for the most part, we formaldehyde is the most toxic when it's in its carbonyl state. Um, and being toxic and keeping things preserved is the primary purpose in biolabs. It's usually easier to just consider it to be in the formaldehyde form. That's the form that biologists care about it. They don't care that it's that it's more likely to be here. If you have a little bit of the formaldehyde around, that goes a long way towards keeping things preserved um, and preventing further um, further decay in biological specimens. So, and it's easier to draw, frankly, and understand what's going on if you just treat it like it's formaldehyde. Realistically, it's really this bottom right structure or this one in the middle here uh, in the form that we see it in biolabs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here's the the full reaction written out, at, or the full mechanism written out. But this first section, that's our nucleophilic addition, and this second step, or a second half of the re reaction is our nucleophilic substitution in which we have the nucleophile attacking before the leaving group leaves in this case. So this would be SN2, right? Because SN2 is the one where you had your leaving group leaving at the same time as your nucleophile is attacking. Actually, no, I, I just said that wrong, didn't I? It has leaving group leaving first, which would make this an SN1 reaction. All right, I'm gonna go back a second to look at the overall reaction. So thinking back to Le Chatelier, which it's been a while, right? But just thinking back to equilibrium in general and how if you change an equilibrium, the system will shift to undo that change. If we wanted to favor the acetal formation, if we wanted to make the acetal, what would we? What could we do to make this molecule to to change the equilibrium to favor that molecule? There are two big things for for Le Chatelier's, right? It was changing heat or changing amount of product or reactant, right? If we want to make more of the product, we could change the amount of the other of the byproduct. If we did this under conditions that had very little water, or if we removed the water as we were making the product, we could get the equilibrium to move more towards the product side. Um, on the flip side, Temperature also plays a role, right? In general, temp high temperature favors the, the more random side, right? Side with more molecules. We took two separate molecules and turned them into one hemiacetal, right? And then for the second step, we had two separate molecules and then we, lot we made a water. So the second step, the entropy is about neutral. But for the first step, the entropy favors the reactants, right? So at high temperature, we would expect to see these. 
at low temp, we would expect to see the acetal. So low temperature um, in environments with little to no water, we're going to favor the acetal. If you have lots of water around, and at high temperatures, you're going to favor making the carbonyl. And high temperatures in this case could be something as, as um, reasonable as room temperature. Room temperature is going to favor the carbonyl unless you've done a really good job of removing all water from the system. If you've done a good job and there's no water around or you're removing water as you make it, you can wind up um, favoring the acetal product. So here's more practice with mechanisms, um, drawing, making the acetal. The one I'm going to work through, I'm going to work through C, um, just because C looks a little bit different in that both of the alcohols are on the same molecule. Um, but the mechanism doesn't wind up working any differently. We just wind up making a cyclo product as a result. But it's still going to be nucleophilic addition first, then nucleophilic substitution, where you have water as a leaving group. So acetone. If we have our alcohol around this, and this is ethylene glycol is, uh, is the alcohol here, which is uh, antifreeze. Um, the, the technical name would be 1,2-ethane-diol, um, but the common name is ethylene glycol. So if we are un, in acidic conditions, the first thing we're going to do is protonate that carbonyl. So I guess let me... Since this problem says draw the mechanism, I suppose I should draw the whole mechanism too. So if we've got sulfuric acid, one of the protons can be can be donated pretty easily. And I say pretty easily, I mean that. Um, sulfuric acid gives away that proton so quickly that can't even can't even see it. As my old OCHEM professor would have said, it goes like a rocket. Um, I don't know how that applies to sulfuric acid, but that's just what he used to say about sulfuric acid: is it goes like a rocket. So we we wind up with an intermediate that would look like protonated acetone. And then we can have the alcohol come in and act as the nucleophile. All right, so our hemiacetal is going to look like is going to look like this. Um, and I left off showing the last proton transfer step. Again, I guess I probably shouldn't do that. See, this is the OCHEM equivalent of not showing all your algebra steps um, is just, well, but then it just does a proton transfer. We don't need to worry about that. It just does it. Um, but I suppose I should probably still show it. So if we had that um, deprotonated sulfuric acid floating around still, as hydrogen sulfate. There's our, our proton transfer step. So then our hemiacetal product 
still got our three carbons from the acetone. This one gets where it, it gets tricky and you need to pay attention to how many carbons you have drawn. To make sure you don't leave, lose a carbon somewhere. Uh, it's really easy on the when you draw the hemiacetal to remove one of the carbons from your ethylene glycol. So remember that there's still two carbons in between those two oxygens. And then we have the nucleophilic substitution. Um, and in general, it says the leaving group leaves first to make a carbonyl-ish intermediate. So we wind up with that. And if we're under acidic conditions, we're probably going to proton transfer first. So that sulfuric acid that we just made once again. is going to wind up protonating here. And you can wind up with this leaving group leaving and the alcohol oxygen or the ether oxygen turns into a carbon oxygen pi bond. All right, and so this looks like a mess right now. So I'm going to redraw the our new intermediate after the out after the OH leaves. We still have all three carbons from the acetone. They're just now attached in a carbonyl that has three bonds, and then you had the rest of the ethylene glycol still attached as well. Right, so the first step in going from the hemiacetal to the acetal is your OH group leaves. And you make this sort of carbonyl ish intermediate. Then your second alcohol can come in. In this case, your second alcohol is on the same molecule but it wouldn't look any different if it was two separate molecules. Your, whatever OH group you still have around can come in here and attach. So our new intermediate is gonna look like It's going to look like that. One more proton transfer step, and we're home free. And again, whatever you had that gave you the acid in the first place um, can act as the base now and just come in and. and we get our final product. All right, so this reaction in particular, using ethylene glycol to make an acetal winds up being really useful in terms of synthesis because carbonyls are pretty reactive, but ethers aren't. So this is an, um, we used this term once before, um, a protecting group where we had to convert an OH group into something that was a um, that wouldn't react, right? Do you guys remember doing that at least vaguely, even if you don't remember what the reactants were? Um, if we if we have want one of our reactive groups, our functional groups to react, but not the other, a protecting group is one way we can do that. And so carbonyls are protected by converting them to acetals and then back the other way. So if we do this in an anhydrous environment with no water around, we can favor making the acetal, then we can have the rest of the, rea the molecule react, and then we can convert that acetal back to the carbonyl. 
So it adds steps, but it's a way to very, very specifically keep one part of the molecule from reacting. All right, so we're going to go into that and, and how that would actually look in some practical synthesis uh, applications here in uh, after break. Let's take a 10 minute break and come back at nine o'clock and we'll go over this slide and do some more practice with this. <laughs> 
All right, everyone. Thanks for your patience. My my wife Laura is running a meeting right now, and that means Valence needed some help getting Daniel Tiger going. Because when you're too young to drink coffee, nothing gets your morning started like a little Daniel Tiger. Um, I also I pushed the due date on last week's lab to Friday, and I'm not going to add a new assignment this week for lab because I know some of you guys are still struggling with the last two labs because they were a little bit tricky and getting the technology to work um, is a bit of a hassle um, and not something that uh, um, necessarily we're ready for in this class. So there's no new assignment this week for lab unless you're done. If you finish last week's assignment and you want another um, and you want to practice it some more, finding transition states, et cetera, um, I'll have a an extra credit assignment um, in lab today that's going to look a lot like last week's lab, where I give you a reaction and your job is to find the potential energy surface for it. Um, so it'll be a different reaction. So it'll be a little bit. Um, so you'll have to build your reactants and then build your transition state and do the transition state search and then find the energies just like we did last week. But the good thing is if you already did last week's lab and you have that done, that potential energy surface done in um, Excel, putting different energies in for different molecules is really, really easy. And then you can you have a new potential energy surface um, because you've already done the work of building out that that Excel sheet. So once you have that Excel sheet, um, finding the geometries is the hard part. And then getting the transition, the potential energy surface from that is pretty straightforward. Um, so again, that'll be a an extra credit assignment if you want that. Otherwise, you can use the time as office hours or um, to get your your jobs running correctly from last week or even the week before if you're still struggling on building some of those geometries. Um, I forgot we had some people that are using Chromebooks and MacMole PLT is great for Macs and for PCs, but it doesn't do Chromebooks well. Um, so if you're having issues with that, or if you want to use a different program, I have some options um, as well. So, um, and and if all you want to do is finish your your assignment, it's the due date for the for last week's lab assignment is now on Friday. So you have this week to to finish it up. Um, I would recommend getting it done during lab today if possible, just because you have the time. You're already scheduled to be there, um, and you'll have me there with you as, as much as you need. Um, but I'm not going to force you to have it done before you leave lab today um, because that would be that would be ridiculous. You're adults. You can you can prioritize your own stuff. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about these protecting groups. So here was our overall net reaction. So this is simplifying things a fair bit. Um, this is the formation of the acetal. So the overall re or the reaction showing more steps looked like this. This was our mechanism for the acetal formation, where it went through the hemiacetal and then made the acetal. Um, but the net reaction looks pretty simple. You start with a carbonyl. If you have an alcohol um, or a diol, in a, especially in an acidic environment, um, you can turn that into the acetal. And the net reaction is just you're just removing water from that molecule. However, if you have the acetal and you add water in an acidic environment, you go the other direction. Uh, and this is one of the re one of the reasons why um, why making simple syrup. If you've ever made simple syrup um, in the kitchen before. Um, you were taking a hemiacetal and converting it to the open chain form. You're breaking apart that hemiacetal to form the open chain form of each of those the carbohydrates. So you were taking sucrose and converting it into glucose and fructose separately, um, which is why simple syrup tastes a little bit different than just sugar. If you, you, it takes a little pinch of lemon and then you just heat it with water. And that's exactly what this bottom reaction is, is doing, right? A little bit of acid, heat it with water, and you wind up breaking apart these acetals and hemiacetals to make the carbonyls. Um, 
And so in, um, I believe it's been a long time, but they do this in, um, in brewing because uh, yeast does not break down sucrose well, but it can break down um, glucose and fructose easily. So if you want to get your yeast culture started, but all you have is sucrose, you have to take your sucrose and you heat it with a little bit of lemon juice and you turn it into these separate monosaccharides that yeast can actually break down. Um, so they call that making a yeast starter. You get your yeast culture nice and healthy. It's like having a sourdough starter, except for making beer instead of bread. Um, if we can control how much water we have and what the concentrations are of our alcohol reagents, that's going to allow us to favor one side versus the other, right? Just the same way we were mentioning before, um, if we take away water, we're going to favor making the acetal. If we add extra water, we're going to favor making the carbonyl. So... And since ethers are less reactive than carbonyls, that allows us to prevent the oxidation or reduction of carbonyl carbons. So remember oxidation and, and reduction, if we took a, um, a carbonyl and we tried to reduce it, we'd be turning it into an alcohol, right? Well, if you already have an ether, you can't further reduce that without breaking a carbon oxygen sigma, sigma bond, which are more stable. So this allows you to reduce some parts of the molecule with hydrides without reducing your carbonyl group or oxidize for that matter. If you have an aldehyde that you don't want to be oxidized to a carboxylic acid, turn it into an acetal. And then you can oxidize whatever else is around without oxidizing your aldehyde. Right, so here's a good example. If we have an ester that also has a ketone, if we want to reduce the ester to an alcohol, but we don't want to reduce our ketone, we can convert the ketone to an acetal. So the reaction steps would look like this, where the, and the intermediates along the way would be you would start by taking, let me switch this to a whiteboard. The first step, if we expose this to ethylene glycol, And it's usually written with more details, you know, so in the presence of acid, minus H2O, the minus H2O is just telling you that it's a, a dehydration reaction. The intermediate would then look like It doesn't affect the ester, so the ester stays where it is. We just convert that ketone into this five-sided ring structure, this acetal structure. Then the second step was lithium aluminum hydride, which reduces everything till your only carbon oxygen bonds are sigma bonds. So if we take this and then expose it to LiAlH4, that's going to basically chop this whole thing off and turn it into a primary alcohol. But it leaves the ether alone. Then if we add water, especially with acid, that's going to take the acetal and turn it back to being the carbonyl. So we'll wind up with 
this molecule. If we skipped the protecting group, if we skipped that first step, the lithium aluminum hydride would reduce both of those groups. And we'd wind up with a secondary alcohol where the ketone is and a primary alcohol where the ester was. But by doing the protecting group first, we kept that, that ketone as it is. Well, the net result is that ketone doesn't change. We converted it to the acetal and then changed it back to a ketone after the reduction was done. Cody? Yeah, why is it that the protecting group um, or the diol goes for the ketone carbonyl instead of the ester carbonyl? So remember when we when I first introduced carbonyls, I said that we're, there were two classes of carbonyls. There was the class one carbonyls that had a good leaving group attached. And then the class two carbonyls was the ketone and the aldehydes um, that don't have a good leaving group. The fact that it's a class two, the ketone is a class two carbonyl, um, means that it will react to make these acetals better than an ester will. An ester, an acid group, an amide group, any of those that have a good leaving group already attached um, aren't going to go through this process. Um, they, they might have their own side reactions where it's converting from one ester to a different ester, because when, we'll find out that when you have an ester and it reacts with an alcohol, you can convert this extra section over here. You could convert that into um, putting this diol there instead, but you still wind up with an ester. You don't wind up with an acetal because it's that class two carbonyl because it already has a good leaving group there. All right. All right. Any other questions on on this mechanism? All right, then let me clear all this and go back to all right, so so that's basically just a a very specific case of um, nucleophilic addition reactions to make that acetal in it, but it winds up being useful enough and it shows up in biology as well. Um, and so it winds up getting its own section in this textbook, despite the fact it's not inherently any different of a mechanism. The fact that you can use an alcohol or a water as your nucleophile to make these acetals or hemiacetals. Um, if you use water, we made the diol. And if you use an alcohol as your nucleophile, you made the hemiacetal and the acetal. Um, those oxygen based nucleophiles are common enough that they're worth their spending their own time spending the time on it to um, getting their own section in the textbook um, because they show up everywhere. If you take a biochemistry class, you will talk about acetals at some point um, because that's one of the primary um, parts of um, breaking down molecules, macromolecules, especially to make energy for the cell is to take things like starch and convert it from being a hemiacetal back to being a carbonyl. And then it can be processed by glycolysis in the citric acid cycle. Um, if we use a nitrogen as our nucleophile instead of an oxygen, we wind up making slightly different classes of molecules. Um, for instance, if you have an amine reacting with a class two carbonyl, we wind up making this alcohol with an amine attached to it. Um, which we call a carbonylamine, which is not very stable on its own. This is kind of similar, though, to making a hemiacetal and then an acetal. Um, and it, it's similar in terms of what the net reaction is, too. It's a dehydration reaction where you're going to replace a carbonyl oxygen with a nitrogen. Um, the difference is, is that because the nitrogen can form a, a double bond, can form a pi bond with the what was the carbonyl carbon and still have an R group attached, you wind up with this imine being a stable intermediate. And not even just an intermediate, you wind up with the imine being a stable molecule. Um, and it's 
um, winds up being a pretty convenient way to store carbonyl compounds because carbonyl compounds will react with the air um, to become oxidized pretty easily. But if you convert them to an imine, imines don't react with the air ne nearly as, as readily. And so you can actually store these as an imine and then convert it back to being a carbonyl later, sort of like a protecting group. Um, and it's also imines typically have um, very, very clear melting points. And so if you want to prove that you made what you think you made in the synthesis in lab, uh, a lot of times what you do is you take, you make an imine derivative and then take the melting point of it. Because a lot of these carbonyl compounds, their melting points are kind of, um, they're either close to room temperature or they kind of melt over a really broad range. So it's hard to tell exactly where it was melting. But imines typically melt at a higher temperature than room temperature and they melt at a, they have a very crisp melting point where their melting point is very, very well defined at a specific temperature. And so a lot of times to try and prove that you have what you think you have, you actually convert it to an imine and then you compare the melting point to the imine. Um, and that process is called making a derivative of your product um, to prove that you actually made that product. Um, but the mechanism here is winds up being very, very similar to acetal formation. You start with, nucleophilic addition. And then you just have a leaving group leaves, essentially. It's not even a nucleophilic substitution for the second step. It's just your leaving group leaves. All right, and so this is a little bit similar to an enol as well, where we made something as, as an intermediate that was not all that stable that immediately went through a rearrangement, basically. Uh, if you do this in an environment where it doesn't have much water, the water winds up being a good leaving group, and you just wind up converting to this imine structure. Um, we do see some imines showing up in pharmaceutical chemistry. They're not as common. Um, the body doesn't use imines as a, as a common um, functional group, and so it winds up not being something that um, if you try to put this in a pharmaceutical setting, um, the imines don't bond to the binding sites very well in, in um, your cells. And so it winds up not being all that useful um, for a lot of, I think, I'm sure that there are some exceptions, there are some imines that are common pharmaceuticals um, or relatively common pharmaceuticals, but it's not nearly as common as amides or amines or alcohols in terms of pharmaceutical chemistry. In fact, now I, now I want to check that. And my usual go-to, if I want to know uh, what kind of functional groups show up where in pharmaceutical chemistry is just to go to Wikipedia and see. It's used as a precursor to heterocycle. So a lot of heterocycle, a heterocycle just means a um, a cyclic structure where one of the carbons in your cyclic structure is not a carbon. So like replacing a carbon with an oxygen to get furan, for instance. Um, it, that's that class of molecules where you have a ring structure where one of the members of the ring is not a carbon is called a heterocycle. Um, so it looks like they're in heterocycles do show up in pharmaceuticals because uh, serotonin is a heterocycle, right? Serotonin has that fused ring structure where some of the carbons are replaced with nitrogens. Um, imines are common in nature. I wouldn't call that an imine necessarily. Prov promotes a DM and so vitamin B6 is a compound that is it has a heterocycle involved that kind of looks like an imine, but it's really part of a larger aromatic ring structure. So I wouldn't call that um, an imine per se. Um, but it does, according to Wikipedia anyway, um, it does wind up uh, deaminating 
amino acids. And so deamination means you're removing the amine group from an amino acid. And that can be as a way to turn the one amino acid into a different amino acid, or it can be just as a way to remove excess nitrogen from your body. Um, so this would be playing a role in the, um, in the urea cycle where your body takes excess amino acids and converts all the extra nitrogens into urea, which then your body can flush through your urinary system. Um, but it's definitely, it says it's common in nature, and then somebody went through and put citation needed. So somebody else doesn't think it's very common in nature anyway. Um, this reaction is interesting in that it needs both base and acid for this to happen. And there's some, the acetyl formations, we saw this to some extent as well, because you needed a nucleophile, which, and nucleophiles are basic, but you also needed an acid to start the reaction. And so um, we see this a fair bit. It's almost like an enzyme catalyzed reaction where there's a sweet spot for the pH where the reaction rate is fastest if you're at a certain pH range. If you get too basic, then you don't have enough, um, you don't have an acid around that can protonate your leaving group. If you're too acidic, then you don't have a base around um, that can, or you, then you wind up protonating your amine and your amine can't act as a nucleophile then. So, uh, and we see this a lot and this is a good example of how, um, of why proteins have a specific sweet spot when it comes to pH as well, because a, most enzymes in your body and in, in any living cell rely on both proton, on proton transfers and having these um, lone pairs present for the um, amines. If you don't have the lone pairs present, then your amines can't bond to the right spot in your in the enzymes, or the enzymes change shape um, based on on the fact that they don't have a, a uh, an amino group with a lone pair. And if you go too far the other way and you make it too basic, you wind up with the opposite happening. You don't have any protons around for the proton transfer reactions, right? So it as we get to these more complex mechanisms, we'll start to see. Um, Basically, we have to be careful with the pH. We don't want it to be too acidic or too basic. So if we, and here's a, a going back to, here's our overall reaction for imine formation. Um, if we have a secondary amine, so this is a primary amine, where we have one carbon attached to the nitrogen. If a second, if you have a secondary amine, so two R groups and one hydrogen with a lone pair, that can't form an imine without kicking off one of those R groups, right? We can't, we can't have a, a nitrogen with four bonds to it be stable. And so you're not going to form an imine if you have a secondary amine, even though the rest of the reaction can look the same, if it's a secondary amine, then we're gonna stop and we're gonna go a different route once we get to the carbonylamine. So the carbonylamine was the equivalent of the hemiacetal where we've got, um, where we have an OH group still attached to the carbonyl oxygen, but then we've also added a new bond. Right, so the carbonylamine, in this case, the, the mechanism would look something like the, so in an acidic environment, so we're going to start by protonating that carbonyl and the amine can come in here and attach. So our carbonylamine is going to look like this. So 
if it was a primary amine, we would kick off the oxygen as a water molecule. We'd form a carbon nitrogen pi bond. Um, but we can't do that and keep the nitrogen neutral in this case. So we wind up making a different molecule. Uh, and it goes through. Um, that same carbonylamine intermediate, and we still wind up with deprotonating, or sorry, um, dehydrating the molecule by removing a water molecule. So we're still going to have a proton transfer where we make a good leaving group. So what if my medicine and where the hydrox is open? Okay, I'll, I'll come close it in a second, okay? Thank you. You wave and say hi. All right, let me finish class, okay? And then I'll take care of that. Thanks for trying to fix it. Can you close the door? You can stay in here if you want. You gotta close the door. All right, so we get to that carbonylamine, which is the structure that I just drew. We still are gonna protonate the alcohol that's remaining, and it's gonna be a good leaving group the problem is that when we get to the what would be the imine, that imine is not very stable because we wind up with a nitrogen with four bonds to it. So it goes one extra step, which is very similar to an enol uh, tautomerization, where we wind up actually um, doing a elimination reaction with one of the alpha carbons to make what's called an enamine. So ene for alkene, amine because you have a nitrogen attached to it. So the overall reaction is very, very similar to making an imine, except if it was an imine, this structure right here in the, um, in the middle, this intermediate, would be stable because you have a nitrogen with three bonds, so it's neutral. But if you don't have a good leaving group on that nitrogen, we wind up with this intermediate that's charged. And in order to make it more stable, it has to kick off another hydrogen to make the enamine. All right, I believe this is either close to the last, last slide or close to it. Yeah, this is the last slide. So we have some reactions we can practice here. Um, I'm going to give you guys, uh, uh, let you guys go a few minutes early, and then we'll start off lab since we're not adding any new lab um, assignments this week. We'll start off lab by going through these solutions, right? So to recap, alcohols go and form the hemiacetal or the acetal from a carbonyl. Um, primary amines make the imine. Secondary amines make the enamine. Did you have a big day last week? What happened last week? Was it was it April twenty second last week? Mm -hmm. What day is that? You say it louder so they can hear you. We turned five last week, so we are gearing up for kindergarten next year. Happy birthday! All right, so I'll, I'll let you guys work on these um, and then we'll, we'll go over the solutions to them at the beginning of lab at one. All right. Any questions before we stop for the day? All right, then everybody have a good morning and I'll see you after lunch. Bye-bye.